On today's episode of Nerdy Dating, we talk about The Science of Happily Ever After by Tai Tashiro. We give three takeaways from this book here, which is a dating book, a relationship book. We also talk about when is the right time to have sex with somebody, and we talk about scheduling. And if you are not the guy's schedule, it means he doesn't want to date you anymore? Stick around, because this is another packed episode. What's up, world? Welcome to another episode of Nerdy Dating. I am your host, Ali Zaka. And what is Nerdy Dating? It is a relationship advice podcast from a viewpoint of a nerd here in Kansas City, Missouri, which is considered one of the worst cities to date in. And heck, if I can date in Kansas City and have successful dating life, then you can do the same thing anywhere else. And also, me being a nerd, if a nerd can do it, you can too. So that's what this podcast is about, is just to give advice and kind of help those find a partner and, and have a successful relationship and what can help with that also please continue to share subscribe and give the podcast out to your friends and family i really appreciate those who do that and appreciate those who talked about it thank you guys so much thank you from the bottom of my heart now let's go and get into today's topic which is one of the books i finished reading here and another book i read regarding dating and communication and relationships and how to be a better partner is the signs of happily ever after what really matters in the search for true love this is by tai tashiro he's a phd and he had read a bunch of studies and put together a bunch of studies regarding a successful relationship he's also a therapist and worked with couples as well and kind of things he learned and seen over the years from breaking down the societal mindset when it comes to dating like such as height and attractiveness and certain money quota to you know figuring out how to find red flags to figure out how to be a better partner and, and how to better communicate and I'm going to bring out three takeaways I got from this book, three of them. And the first one that I took from this is capitalizing on the good stuff, capitalization. So what is capitalization in this? It is sharing a positive event and your partner matches the enthusiasm in their response. That is capitalization and what they found out with couples who are married and together and and couples who have been together for a long time they utilize capitalization a lot in positive capitalization so people share positive events with their partner 70 percent of the time this came from a study by shaley shelly gable from the university of california and when your partner who has positive events that happen to them which is Little, little or big, or big or small, it doesn't matter what the positive event could be. It could be finding a quarter on the ground to, you know, buying a brand new pair of jeans that they got for $20 with a, with a deal and a steal of it. It's like a steal of a deal. They're excited about these pair of jeans. And that's the example we're going to use for this concept here. But your partner actual response to your perception of your partner's response are key to successful capitalization and what does that mean that means how you perceive your partner's response to what you're excited about and how your partner reacts to that can lead to a successful capitalization can lead to good moments so for example there are two type of response your partner does actively and passively and the way they respond are constructive and deconstruct and destructive so how they pat how they respond to you is actively or passively response to what you say and how they go about it which is constructive destructive so there's four altogether combinations with this there is the best moment is active and constructive and now what is active and constructive it's when your partner is enthusiastic and engaged about the positive news so for example you found a brand new pair of jeans you're excited about it got it for twenty dollars it is a steal i mean brand new jeans looking good you're excited about it. you love the way the jeans fit on you you're excited you come to your partner hey look what i found I found these pair of jeans today while i was out in the store i wasn't looking for jeans they end up finding them they look amazing on me they feel good and they got up for twenty dollars twenty dollars what a steal and they're like durable like they're gonna last for years and your partner re- respond just it's like oh my god you found a deal look at you good job like i mean i'm happy for you that you found a pair of jeans for a seal like that right there that 
is an example of active constructive. Your partner is enthusiastic and engaged with the positive just like you are. Now, what, and that's the best scenario. Good scenario is passive constructive. Now, what is that? Your partner has a positive attitude and says little and shows little outward enthusiasm. So you're like, I found a pair of jeans, still $20, amazing, they fit, get on me, and your partner's like, that's nice, awesome, happy for you. Okay, it's, they're excited for you, they give you, they give you positive news, but their calendar's like, yeah, that's cool. Then, it's good, but it's not the best. Bad is passive destructive, which is your partner discount the sharing, sorry, your part, your passive destructive is bad because your partner discounts the sharing by changing the subject or ignoring the remarks. So they come in, he's like, found these pair of jeans, excited, $20 off, and they're like, that's cool. Like, hey, did you hear about so-and-so today? Did you see what happened at work today? Let me tell you about my day. And you're like, I, well, I just had a moment here and I was excited to share it with you, but you just completely brushed it off. All right, well, and then there's active destructive, which is the worst, the worst. And what is that? Is your partner says something critical about the positive news? So you're happy about the $20 jeans you found, you're excited about your partner, like, why are you spending $20? I don't care about the jeans, like what are you doing that for? Like you know you're saving up for you know this big trip and you're wasting your money away. $20 isn't within my budget, I was excited about it, or they're like, I hate the jeans, don't like them at all. And you're like, why would you tell me that? Like, what, what's the benefits of it here? Those, it, that is the worst case scenario, it's active destructive. So the best scenario is, is active, constructive. You want your partner to be just enthusiastic about it with you. And what they found out when they did the study that the best marriages and the best relationships, they have stronger marital satisfaction and stronger intimacy because they capitalize on capitalization. Your partner is, is just as excited as you are about things and openly and listen to you and just happy for you that you found things and vice versa. You're happy for your partner as well and your partner share positive news with them. Like they have a little win where they found a, a podcast or they found something that got them excited about that day. It's a little win and you should pretty much support your partner when they have those moments. Now, not every partner is going to be able to do this. So when you want to, how to find a good partner that does it, when it comes to dating, you want to make sure you choose a partner who is able to have those moments and be able to share with you. And in the book, I'm actually going to read straight from here, straight, actually I'm going to read straight paragraph and everything. So what do the results studies, results from studies of capitalization tells us about wishing for traits in, in a partner? He said, I see three essential things to look for when assessing whether a partner will help you grow your relationship with po with positive. So, one, choose a partner who is willing to share positive events. Although most people share their small and big news, big positive events frequently, not everyone does. And those with traits such as avoiding attachment may feel too fearful to risk a partner not being responsive to their positive news so it means you got a partner who doesn't want to open up to you find a partner that opens up to you and be willing to share the positive news two choose a partner who is attentive and empathetic enough to know just how much a positive event means to you in the larger scheme of your life this kind of partner responds with genuine enthusiasm to your good news because he or she is invested in your success and well-being that's another thing you look for in a partner and i know there's people out there like well now everybody's gonna share it now everybody's gonna be genuine about how you go through here's a third one choose a partner who has enough self-esteem to believe that your enthusiasm about his or her positive news is genuine partners with low self-esteem may be prone to actually or passively discounting your validation of their good news or your feelings of genuine happiness about their accomplishments. So those are the three things they mentioned when it comes to find a partner who will help with capitalization and help create that stronger bond. And that's the number one. So the, the first one I took away was find a partner who is big with capitalization, positive capitalization, and able to express and 
just support you and be happy for you when you have positive things happen. And you should do the same thing for your partner. It should be back and forth. You both should be building each other up, not being you no know, active, destructive, and destroying each other down when you have a positive moment. Because what happens if you shut your partner down when they're sharing things about what they had and they're excited about? They're going to stop sharing with you and you'll find yourself in a situation where they might not want to talk to you about certain stuff because they don't know it's going to set you off and they got to get nagged at. So that's the first takeaway from the book. The second takeaway I got from the science of happily ever after is agreeableness. They say agreeableness is one of the best predictors of long-term relationship happiness and these people kind of get a bad rep because they usually are painted as the good guy the nice guy the sweet girl or nice girl tag but agreeable people tend to be have better relationship satisfaction and they are more stable relationships as well so Agreeable people are less likely to have deconstructive behavior like manipulation, greed, antagonism, and narcissistic behaviors. They are more likely in building relationships and behaving like this. One, compassion. Two, trust. Three, uh, spirit of cooperation are those three things that they are more likely to do. So... And building better relationships, they're more likely to do that and less likely to have deconstructive behavior and more likely to have relationship building behavior. This is done in a study by Brittany Solomon and Joshua Jackson from Washington University in St. Louis. And people who are agreeable also have a less likelihood of breaking up. And to add to it, their tendencies to show more empathy and less likely to participate in destructive behavior and destructive behavior in conversation as well. Highly high agreeableness and people who have high agreeableness have better sex and have a high sexual satisfaction. This is from 2018 psychological bulletin. Um, Mark Allen and Emma Walters, they found out that people who are agreeable are high in conscientiousness and they're less likely to engage in sexual infidelity. So, you want to find a partner who is agreeable and it makes sense. You don't want to have a partner who is constantly, you know, nagging at you or constantly every time you bring up something just throwing it back at you like, no, that doesn't matter. No, that doesn't count. And just kind of going back and forth. So anytime you bring up something, they're always trying to like pretty much prove that you're wrong or just disagree with you for just the sake of disagreeing or because they don't think you're right. Like you don't want to have a partner that you're constantly at odds and constantly try to try, have to convince that you're right or constantly bring up like, okay, here's something I learned today and what I do saying, hey, this is what I learned without them saying, well, where'd you get your facts from? Without fact checking you, without calling like, no, nah, I don't think that's right or what it case would be versus taking it and like, oh, that's neat. Like, okay, we'll learn more about it because there's a, there's a reaction, there's a difference there. A partner who's Want to be engaged and want to learn more about what you got some information from and just want to like, you know, dig into it with this world with you versus just saying no because they want to say no or contradict you just to contradict you. You always don't want a partner who wants to contradict you. person who is agreeable, they will be, you know, be willing to um, listen to you. I'm not sure I've stopped there for a moment, but be willing to kind of take in what you're saying and not just shut it down and not trying to cause like a problem they'd be willing to listen to have a conversation with you and they said here you know their compassion trust and spirit of cooperation they were willing to work together on something so you want to have a partner that's agreeable and willing to you know help you out just like how you should be able willing to help them out like you shouldn't be at odds with your partner 90 percent of the time that's not healthy now we know there's time where partners go butt heads. That's going to happen. That's what happened in a relationship when you expect to merge your lives together. But to be at odds with somebody 90% of the time is stressful. So find a partner who's going to be better, who's going to be more agreeable and not. And when I say agreeable, you don't want a partner who they want you to do something. You're doing something that puts you in harm's way. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about if everybody's safe, everybody's taken care of, everybody's all, you know, in good spirits here, you want a partner who is agreeable, especially in the bed. Like, hey, I like doing this. Can we do this? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Why not? Like, you want a partner who be willing to go back and forth with you versus saying anything you bring up. No, we're not doing that. No, we don't want to do that. No, we're not doing this. I'm not like that. Mm -mm, find somebody else. Like, oh, okay. And there's actually a mention 
in this that like when it comes to sex it's you can't find another partner who unless you're in an open relationship who's be willing to have the sexual experience with you like when you play tennis they actually relate to sports when you play tennis if you find a you know have a partner who's not good at tennis you can just find a new tennis partner to play with when it comes to sex you just can't get up and say well my partner's sex in bed and they don't want to you know they don't want to try to learn anything. You just can't give them like, I'm just going to walk out there and find a new partner who actually wants to do the same things I want to do in bed. You just can't do that and keep your relationship intact. You can't do that. Now you open a relationship that's different and that's a whole different dynamic, but you're changing the relationship. It's not is what it is and not what it was before. You're adding a third person to the part in a relationship and depending on what your viewpoint is, it's, it can get sticky or not. So, but we're talking about just a pure monogamous relationship you just can't be like my partner doesn't want to do this in bed and I really like doing this and they don't want to do this you can't be like well screw it I'm just gonna find another partner to do the same thing but keep everything else in relationship you can't so you want to find a partner who will be willing to be you know everything safe and everything's in good spirit who'll be willing to you know try things with you and be agreeable with you in the bed and you should be agreeable with your partner too what they like what you like you guys should try that stuff out on the bed side but they said People who do this have a less likelihood of breaking up and have better marital satisfaction as well. Um, well, I guess better sexual satisfaction, not marital, but they do have a long-term relationship happiness. So that's the other thing I took away. Somebody who agreeable. You want to find a partner who not always trying to cut you down or always retort or always um, contradict you every you know, second. You don't want somebody who does that. You want to be a partner who... We have fun with him and, and you guys agree on a lot of stuff. So agreeableness is the second thing I took away from this book. The third thing I took away from the signs of happily ever after is a twofer. It's a twofer. And the first one is probably gonna be pretty short. Is physical attractiveness. Somebody's physical attractiveness, how they look, the physical look. There's actually no study that you can find, and this is from James McNulty, who actually study 82 newlyweds but there's no relationship between partner satisfaction and physical attractiveness in a relationship which means depending on what people consider a partner some somebody be you know quote unquote i guess culturally or socially attractive like like really hot there is no pretty much no relation between partners marital satisfaction relationship satisfaction and somebody's physical attractiveness means no matter how hot your partner is there's not an indicator whether or not that relationship is going to last or you know in in a hot end up in smoke and flames there's no indicator on that like physical attractiveness does not really indicate a stable relationship Just because somebody's hot doesn't mean the relationship is going to last and vice versa so that's something that kept, i thought was like all right that's you no know, of course duh but it's just something that the book went over. Like, yeah, because somebody's hot doesn't mean they're going to be in a good relationship. So that is something that I thought that was interesting. And then the second half of that is deal with money. So people are like, oh, well, it shouldn't matter how much somebody makes. Well, actually it does. They found out that if a woman is dating somebody who is at the poverty line or below the poverty line, they're actually too 0.8 times more likely to divorce than somebody who has dating somebody, the woman dating a man or a person who's making 260,000 a year annually. So they say somebody who's making 18,000 a year is more likely to be in a, a relationship that's going in a marriage in a divorce than somebody who is with somebody who's date, dating and married to somebody who's making 260,000 annually. That is, they're 2.8 times more higher. So that was something I thought. I was like, that's interesting. However, they did say once the pat, once past the poverty line, diminishing returns on investment when it comes to relationships. So once a a couple past the poverty line, there's diminishing re, di, diminishing returns on investment when it comes to relationship marital stability, stability relationships marital stability. They says the diminishing diminishing investment diminishing returns now what does that mean it just means the more money you guys are making like it's, it doesn't really mean you know stability doesn't really matter like once you hit a certain threshold it doesn't really matter how much money a person makes because like you guys are both satisfied and you guys see what they said the private line why it costs 
no more likely for divorces because you guys are struggling. You guys are not making money to even take care of yourself, take care of your food, take care of the bills. You guys are legit struggling. And that 18,000 was for um, a single person, but actually the poverty line for a family of four, and this has changed. At the time in 2012, this was for uh, 23,000 a year. It's actually for a family of four, 31,000 now which are 32,000 if you want to round up, but 32,000 annually is for a family of four and for a, a single person is actually 16,000 a year. That's, that's not enough money. That's actually your little, that's nothing. Like you're, you're legit are broke. But once you get over the poverty line of 31,000, let's say for a family of four, there's, there's really no significant amount of association between more wealth and higher levels of psychological well-being so pretty much they said as you go up in the poverty line from poverty line and what they had the time of the book was 75 thousand a year more money than that doesn't really make your life better like you don't as as far as happiness your happiness doesn't increase after you hit 75,000 in 2012. Uh, this has now changed. Um, from a Purdue study back in 2000, I want to say 2018, they stated that the new evaluation for the ideal life and a life of evaluation is 95,000 a year. But they said emotional well being. At its lowest, gets better at sixty thousand a year, and pretty much caps off at seventy five thousand a year. So be, between sixty and seventy five thousand, your emotional well being is going to be at its best. And then after seventy five thousand, it doesn't really increase. But as far as ideal life, it's just that like ninety five thousand is where it is for the United States for money and happiness. They said North America as a whole is one hundred and five thousand annually salary. Is that what, how much money you should have to pretty much exist in all of America. But I thought that was interesting. And these studies, that was from Purdue study in a NASDAQ article. And what they got it from in 2012 was from the 2010 Journal of Divorce in Rag Conger from Iowa University was the one who pretty much did the study and then Purdue went and did the study again later on down the line. But they mentioned that pretty much the more money you have past 75000 and 95000 doesn't really increase your emotional well-being, which means you're going to be covered for everything. And then on top of that, when you're combining families, like you're combining incomes with your partner, you guys most likely are going to have more money. They actually mentioned that 80% of potential partners live above the poverty line. 80% of potential partners, which means the money you're bringing in, if you're making 50000 annually and your partner making 50000 annually, you guys combine, we have, so I get married, it will be making it above, or making 100000 now, pretty much above 75000 make 100000 100, You guys are good. You guys are good. So, to say you, you need a partner that makes, you know, 200000 a year, 100000 a year, and you're bringing in, or you're bringing in 50000 you really don't need that because combine your guys' income together, you guys are going to be set, and you guys are going to be living above the poverty line. So putting that much pressure on a partner making, you know, X amount of dollars, if they're not struggling at the poverty line, they're making more than that, and... Heck, is they're making the I think the national and the national average medium or national medium income right right now for a household is fifty nine thousand annually. Your partner's making the average, and you're making the average. You guys are set, so don't put so much emphasis on the money and how much money that person should make. Now, they're at the poverty line. That's something like, okay, hey, you shouldn't be dating. You should be definitely taking care of your business and make sure your stuff is taken care of. But you're pretty much above that. Once you hit 75 to 90,000, 95,000, you you pretty much got everything covered. You really don't need that much more, you know, in life as far as money to be mentally satisfied. I should say for your for your emotional well-being 
I should say, because then people once the once kick in, and then that's that's you got working yourself there. But it's a whole other conversation for a different day. So that's the three things I took away from this book: the signs of happily ever after. The first one was capitalization, positive capitalization, how that can have a you know positive impact and make relationships last longer. It is having a positive. A, an active constructive response to your partner when they share things and have that same kind of response and be excited for your partner Two, agreeableness partners who are agreeable they pretty much have one better sex and two have um, longer relationships and less likely to cheat and then three Physical attractiveness is not really doesn't equate to a positive relationship or a stable relationship. And money, once you hit past ninety five thousand, you're pretty much it doesn't benefit to have a partner who makes you know. There's not gonna be any more emotional benefit of dating somebody who makes more than ninety five thousand. And then you combine your guys' income, y'all both making above you know fifty. You guys are set. Heck, you both making forty thousand a year. You guys are set because. Your relation, your incomes get combined. You're gonna have a better, you know, you build live life, and your well being won't be. You guys are not struggling, pretty much. So that's what I took away from the signs of happily ever after. And I'm gonna put some of these links in the comment section or in the you know description box below, so that way you guys can click on them and read the articles for yourselves. For you guys out there who love reading, but. Yeah, that's what I took away from this book. And if you want to find this book, I found this in my local Barnes and Nobles. You can Google this and find it and, you know, buy it and read it. But I thought it was a good read and took some good stuff from it. So, yep. Now let's go and get to some Reddits and break those down here in a hot second. All right, here we go. The first one. My girlfriend is mad at me for literally no reason. What should I do about it? So we've been together for three years. Last week, her parents were moving to a new house and I helped them with the move. My girlfriend was there and other family and other and another couple was there and her friends was there as well. We were all working together. On this day, everything was fine and we didn't have any problems. The next day after the move, out of, out of complete nowhere, my girlfriend texted me saying she isn't coming back to my house and is, stay, is not staying with me anymore. She said she's staying with her parents and she said she was only coming by my house to pick up her things and leave. 10 minutes later, she showed up and was all mad, throwing her stuff in her car. I asked about what was going on and she told me not to worry about it. I was asking her all these questions and she just got an attitude with each answer. When she left, I texted her, I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, leave the drama at your parents' house. Yeah, that's that's what you want to tell your partner. <laughs> leave the drama at your parents' house. I do not want to be involved in it. She didn't respond back. I can't think of anything I did to offend her or for her to act like this, I was thinking to myself if I did something wrong when I was helping her parents move or I said something to offend her. I don't know. What should I do about it? Well, one, it sounds, the one, the one leave your drama at your parents' house sounds very immature. It's an immature response to what your partner is going through right now. So, Let's look at yourself first in this situation, because this these kind of things don't happen out of nowhere. Your girlfriend for three years, yeah, I didn't mention y'all age, so I'm going to assume y'all the this response reaction here. I'm going to assume early twenties, mid twenties. Let's let's think about this. This didn't happen out of nowhere. There's either a conversation that happened weeks ago, months ago. She's not telling you about, but whatever it is, I had a discussion and it didn't go well or something happened and you may got into an argument about it. The response at the end here where you told her, leave the drama at your parents' house, that right there shows me you guys, y'all get into arguments, y'all don't talk about it. You either say, well, I'm not dealing with this, I'm moving on, or you guys just kind of shut it off and let that stuff build up. Well, what happened, something built up and she snapped. 
and she's like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, you know, going through it. She probably already went through this breakup two weeks prior to you even got to this point. And now you're you're experiencing the breakup. You just didn't know you was having it. Because you pretty much thought everything was clean under the rug when in reality it wasn't clean. What should you do about this? Reach out to her. Say, hey, I'm not sure what happened. Um, I would love to sit down and talk things out and see, you know, what what what's going on and just kind of like f figure out how this is what what we're going to go from this situation i would sit there and have that conversation with her versus leave the drama at your parents house no because leaving the drama at your parents house is why you're in the situation right now reach out to your girlfriend talk to her have a conversation because as of right now what's happening that your relationship is pretty much about to be gone in a blink of an eye because you didn't take the moment to figure out what was going on here and ask questions this is a moment where you need to be empathetic open up open your ears be empathetic and be ready to sit and have a conversation this conversation is not going to be easy she's going to say things to you that you're not going to like she's going to say things to you that you're going to have a complete contradiction to but here's the thing She's going to live out her emotion. She's going to pretty much put her emotion on the table. And she's not going to be thinking clearly when she's going to be talking. So take everything she says. Listen to her. Listen to her. And hear what she has to say. Take what she says in. Evaluate it. Heck, I probably wouldn't even speak when she starts talking. I bet I'll just let her talk and let her get everything off her chest because she sounds like she's been balling things up. This ain't come out of nowhere. You had to ignore the signs and then it hit or you pretty much been dismissive of everything and that's why it's happening. So have, sit down, have a conversation with her, go to a neutral spot, maybe a coffee shop, maybe sit outside a coffee shop if she don't come to your house, but have a conversation and see, and I, maybe a coffee shop probably wouldn't be a good spot. Maybe go to her parents' house. Maybe you can go out there and it would be awkward to sit outside and have a conversation. But yeah, maybe go to her parents' house and have a conversation outside, like on the front porch or something. Hopefully nobody's around. Or maybe the back porch. Somewhere where you guys can have a moment to get away, but you guys also, she's feel safe enough to, to open up. So that's what you want. But yeah, good luck to you because that didn't happen out of nowhere. You just ignore some things. All right. Next one, regret having sex on third date. We were co-workers before. He helped me out a lot in, at work, so I am really thankful for that. After I quit two months later, he texted me to go to the museum together. The first and second date went very well. On the third one, because neither of us could bring others home, we just sat in the car and drank. Then we kissed and booked the hotel. I don't know why he became so cold after sex. He just played on his phone and ate snacks on his side. No cuddling or talking. I tried to talk to him, but he didn't respond to me at all. Also, he just asked for a hug at the end of the first two dates. But when I feel he even didn't want to say goodbye in the third one, we are both 21. He is a tough lover. The sex is kind of kind of is kind of hurt to me. Now he don't text me anymore. I feel so bad. I feel so regretful to have sex with him easily. What is the right time to have sex? I really don't know what to do in the future. There there isn't a right time to have sex. Right now you're having regret. You thought you had talked to somebody who wanted more than, you know, just sex. You guys co-worker, you knew each other, and sound like this dude right here, in his head, he wasn't ready to take that next step in the relationship. Yes, he wanted to have sex. He 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 got that. But it sounded like like from there he knew, like, okay, I actually don't want to be in a partnership with this person. I just want to hook up with this person. I got my hookup. Here I am. That's his own thing. That's him. And you know right then there, you know right now that, okay, this guy right here is not the best partner for you. Forget him. Throw him out the window. It's not worth it. As far as you go and how you handle this going forward, only have sex when you're ready to have sex. And don't look at sex as a, don't look at sex like the, the way to put it, 
not everyone thinks sex is a moment of connection and thinks sex is something that you, once you have sex, you're stuck with this person forever. Not everybody looks at sex that way. Some people look at sex as a novelty and something to do to have fun with. So with that being in mind and know that like, okay, well for you, sex is something more than just a fun time. It's a moment to have connection, the moment to bond with somebody. That case, don't have sex until you're truly ready to have sex. There isn't a perfect time to have sex. It depends on who you talk to, it's gonna be different. One person gonna tell you, heck, one day is enough for me. Another person tell you, 45 minutes after meeting somebody, it's enough for me. Another person will tell you, I'm not having sex till marriage. Another person will tell you, I'm not having sex until we have a five year relationship. And one person will tell you, I'm not having sex for 90 days. So it depends on what you feel that you're ready for sex is. If your limit for sex is like, hey, I don't wanna have sex until, you know, date seven, date 12, date 50, keep that. But I wouldn't let that person know that either because you don't want somebody dating you just for the goal line of, all right, I gotta make it to seven dates and I can have sex. No, you don't want to have that, that goal line. What you want is you're like, hey, for me internally, I know I want to make sure I'm actually with a person. I'll make sure I'm actually feeling a person enough to have sex with. Heck, you can be, I want to have sex until I'm in a relationship with you. And then after that, if that person prerogative would be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find somebody else. Or, you know what? Sex is, it'd be cool. Sex is fun. But I actually want to get to know you as well and get to date you and see how you are before we have, you know, for sex. And heck, if you get in a relationship and y'all realize y'all don't work together sexually, y'all can always break it up. You're not married yet, so... There you go. But there isn't a perfect time to have sex. There isn't. It's have sex when you're ready to have sex. And when you are ready to have sex, don't put this whole thing of like, well, they have to be into me and they have to love me and they have to be ready to have this relationship with me. This is why we're doing it. No, you gotta take into account that that person's ideal of sex is gonna be different from what your ideal of sex is. And to, you can ask them what this person views sex. That's how you know right then, right then and there. If they tell you, oh, sex is just fun, it's a good thing, I don't really care about it, like, it's just, it's, it is what it is, then you know right then and there they'll be like, all right, this person's not for me. This person's not the person to have sex with. And I'm going to say, toodles and dip. But you hear somebody like, no, sex to me is a bond. I want to make sure I'm having sex with the right person. I'm just not looking to hook up with anybody. Then you're like, all right, I can see where their mindset is at. But the moral of the story is only have sex when you're ready to have sex and do not put, well, I'm ready to have sex and sex means this for me. It should mean the same thing for you. Do not do that to somebody because one, when you do that to somebody, put that, put that stress on somebody that's like, oh, sex has to be the same for you that it means for me. It, it will cause you a lot more grief and heartache because they're not gonna look at it the same way. You can ask somebody what their viewpoint is on sex before you, before you give your viewpoint to see what they think of it. But I wouldn't try to be like, you have to think the same way about me when it comes to sex because that's going to make you feel crappy down the line. But have sex when you want to have sex. Don't put yourself in a situation to, to have sex and then regret it. So it, this sucks that he didn't want to know do the same thing, but he probably had a lot going on. I don't know. I don't know the dude thing. And maybe something you talk to, talk to him about because you don't been on two dates with him. You really didn't know the guy. Work person, work work personality and outside work personality are two different things. One person might present themselves completely different at work and then completely different outside of work. So keep that in mind. And then two, the no cuddling thing. If that's something you want to cuddle and, and talk after sex, find somebody who enjoys that too. Ask somebody what they like. What do you do like to do after sex? Do you like to cuddle and talk or you like, all right, I'm get up and leaving? That'd be a good question to ask on a second date or third date. All right, moving on. Has she lost interest? Hi everyone, I'm hoping to get different views and opinions about what you guys think of my situation. The story goes like this. In the world, I'm playing. <laughs> Water, earth, fire, air. All the nations live in harmony. But everything changed the Fire Nation attack. I'm, I'm playing, all right. Anyway, I'm a 23 male. Who, who was heir to the throne of the Fire Nation and my father burnt me. No, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a 23 male. Been talking to this girl 
female 22 for like five days straight morning till midnight every day then one day we didn't chat to each other just a whole day only or just for a whole day only they didn't chat each other for a whole day only then the next day comes i try to initiate a conversation she responded and everything is still the same we're still close and she still talks to me the same way but one thing changed is she replies so slow now and after some time she leaves me seen or on red it's been three days that I've been trying to have a conversation with her, but she just reply, replies slow and doesn't continue the conversation long anymore and leaves me on red. What I'm curious about is we're, we were so close to each other just a few days ago and even chat until midnight nonstop. Then just after not chatting for one day, she immediately turned like that. What do you guys think is her is the problem? What? would you do if, the, if that happened to you i'm open to nay positive or negative opinions so feel free to comment what you think thanks for helping me out guys very appreciative i don't think english was his first language but what happened was you spent five days straight talking to a girl prior online or you met in text where the case would be but you didn't take action. You didn't take action. You sat and had a conversation with her all day long and you're having this conversation. Good, great, amazing. It's good back and forth, good banter, but you didn't get her off the phone. You didn't get her in person for a date. If that's what you was going for. Now you looking for a pen pal, I do I want to tell you like, okay, cool, but you can't get mad at your pen pal when they start responding to you. you texting, this this is not FaceTiming. This is not a date. This is not a phone call. You're texting back and forth and texting It does it, until you get them in person. It does have you know There's no work. No hurry to a text. There's no Rush to a text if somebody texting it doesn't about being at X location in two hours or hey I'm at this way person here. I'm on my way if it doesn't give you anything about like a destination and a setup at this point, it's all just noise in the wind. Texting, you have to get them off of texting. You can't just let them text. Get them, get them off the phone. Get them off the phone. Meet them in person. Where you went wrong, because she she gave you five days. That is very generous. She gave you five days of good back and forth banter from morning to midnight. That is very generous. From morning to midnight, and she's sitting here wondering, when is he going to invite me out on a date? Why hasn't he invited me out on a date? He must not be interested in me because he's not inviting me out. Virgil, you're super interested in this girl. You got to think you have a good back and forth and you got to think you're really close, but in reality, you wasn't close at all. Texting does not, does not close the gap. It does not make you closer. Heck, I can be whoever I want behind a text, but in person, you get my real personality. You get who I can be. You, there's no thinking and trying to you know, calculate how to respond. It's my first reaction, my facial expression. You know how I am right there in person. Texting, I can sit there and, and cultivate a text, make it perfect, send it out, find the perfect gift, find the, find the perfect picture to throw to this, send it out, perfect emoji. In person, somebody does, you know, the running man and then do the whip nay nay, I'm like, what like out of nowhere why why are you why are you doing the cha-cha slide calm down well we just we're not even they're not even playing the cha-cha slide why are you doing it like my you get my actual reaction versus a, a give somebody did a no cha-cha slide, like respond back huh, cha-cha slide funny ha ha back to my thing she could be talking to somebody else that's a possibility somebody else got her attention and now she's actually going on a date with them because they actually made a move but that's what happened you took too long and she's now losing interest because somebody else is actually taking her time and somebody else is actually taking her on a date. She probably was interested there for that week, but you just became a pen pal and she don't got time for pen pals. Now, what can you do in the situation? You can reach out to her and say, hey, you know, apologize for the long wait. Um, what are you doing this weekend? I'd like to take you out. And see if she responds. If she responds back to that, then you know right then and there, yeah. She's looking for that date and she not, she's not trying to have a pen pal. So that'd be my advice to you. Reach out and say, hey, can I take you on a date? When are you free? 
And matter of fact, you can say when you're free or how, what your Friday night looks like. If you're open, let's meet at this restaurant. Let's go get something to eat. Let's go go bowling. Let's go do some. Let's go have fun. Like get get them off the app. Get them off the phone. Cause right now they're on the phone and they're getting occupied by somebody else. All right, TikTok time. I'll probably do maybe three TikToks and then call this episode a wrap. So this first one here is from Sarah Eaton. I'm not doing a Sarah Eaton video. I'm actually doing a clip that Sarah Eaton is responding to here, which I don't know who this girl is, but she, the main thing is why don't men approach me? So let's go ahead and see what this girl is going to say, and then we'll react to her. How is it that I look like this today, yet no man wants me to be his Okay, let's break that down. So she says, why no man wants her to be his girlfriend when she looks like that? Now, I can tell you right now, she's attractive. And a dude would talk to her just off of physical looks alone. Heck, dude might want to sleep with her off of physical look. But she said girlfriend. She didn't say why nobody approached me. Why nobody um you know want to talk to me. She just said why nobody wants to be my girlfriend. Now she does do something like this. She does do a little step thing. This is serious. Making a video like that on TikTok. That's I see that I'm like, why are you doing a tantrum tantrum tantrum? We are grown adults here, you're doing a tantrum tantrum. What are you doing? What? Stop it. Stop it. Don't do that. But she said girlfriend. Now, I mentioned this with my Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, Kayla video. I said that men, we'll talk to any woman. It doesn't matter what she looks like. If we are attracted to her, we will talk to her. We're attracted, we'll talk to her. Heck, we even want to have a good time, we'll sleep with her. But girlfriend that is different girlfriend to become somebody's girlfriend you gotta connect them more than just physical looks the personality has to be there the the personality communication we're not this person's fun to hang around with we're not the person that adds value to my life and takes away adds fun times and value and, and takes away stress that's what you want when it comes to finding a girlfriend he said, why nobody want to be with a girlfriend? Well, maybe your attitude's not the best. But we don't know that. Well, right here, you just do a tantrum tantrum. So, uh, based off of that, I at least have an idea of, you know, you know, I teach a tantrum on social media. That, to me, doesn't seem like somebody I really want to date. Now, you're just like, how come men want to approach me? Well, those things right there, like, okay, how are you looking in person? Are you looking approachable? Are you smiling? Are you waving at people? Are you look, giving people a, a smirk when you see them, or the case would be? Like, that's different. Are you being open, looking open, going to places, going to events where people are being social so people will, you know, come up and talk to you and whatnot? But you said, why do I want you to be your girlfriend? Well, the reason why nobody wants to be your girlfriend, probably because you have an attitude where you're throwing a tantrum tantrum on social media and stumbling your feet like a five year old kid. I don't want to date a woman who's going to throw, throw tension tantrums. And I hope a woman doesn't want to date a man who's going to throw tension tantrums. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound like a good relationship to be in. It just sounds stressful AF. I said AF. Yes, I know what year this is. Um, so, yeah, that's why. That's why it's your attitude. Personality and attitude will definitely make somebody from just a hot person, a person I want to date and hook up with, to all right, I want to actually you know, spend time with this person. I want to see what this person's like. Communication, being open and talking about things. What this first half of the relationship, first half of this video talks about, when I have a conversation with you and you sound engaged, that makes me want to continue to get to know you. Like, and then you ask questions. You want to be, you know, you want to know the person you're talking to versus like, oh, this man is rich eye candy, so I'm just going to sit, put my arm around him versus what does the dude about? What he wants, what his interest is. Like, those conversations, communication, conversation, and personality will make somebody go from just a person I want to hook up with to girlfriend material. 
All right, next video here. This is from tonight's conversation. Let's see what we got going on here. If you're dating a woman that was in a previous relationship and y'all getting serious, but her ex keeps overstepping her his boundaries, popping up at houses, popping up at hey, listen, work. Cousin. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Bro, if she has not cleared the baggage out of her own life, yeah. you do not know the lengths that he will go to. For real. Yeah. Listen, homie. This ain't about y'all feelings. This ain't about the vibe. This ain't about none of that. This ain't even about what you willing to do as a man. Cause I don't know you. This about a who already out of pocket. You about to bring a situation into your life where there's a factor that's already unpredictable. We just mm -hmm. talked about a man with structure and having some to lose. Whether you a man with structure now or you aspire to be one, you already inviting some into your life Thanks. that has something incontrollable orbiting around it. Be careful, Brody. If y'all not serious now, go ahead and step away. I ain't saying you got to step away permanently, but it's not your responsibility to, to, to handle that, to even ponder on how to handle that. You feel me? Mm. Like, that's on her. Now, I, I pray the best for her. You feel me? I, I want her to be safe and all that. But like, cuz, like, don't don't put yourself in danger trying to figure somebody else's situation out, bro. I mean that. Ooh. Ooh. I agree with him on that. I actually agree with him. Like, yeah, you have an ex. Your partner has an ex that's overstepping their boundary. Who is who showing up like like he said, showing up at the house, showing up out of nowhere, popping up at places. Yeah, one she definitely need to give like a restraining order to that person, or whatever it can be. Like, make sure that business handle. Also, is she still entertaining this man? If you talk to somebody about their ex and they said my ex is because there's people who are still friends with their ex, that that happens. But if their ex is not respecting the boundaries, not, not respecting the fact that they're in a relationship and not stepping away and not and then this communication where the person is entertaining this ex and letting the ex show up randomly. Like you said, you probably better off stepping away from that relationship because it's not something you're comfortable with. You don't put yourself in a relationship where you're not comfortable with something. If that's what she's comfortable with, she's comfortable with her ex appearing, her ex showing up in random times and just having a conversation with him. They're talking and he's trying to get back together with her. If she's comfortable with that and she's entertaining that, that's something she needs to clean up. She needs to get that done with. And hopefully, like you said, hopefully she's okay and hopefully she's safe and, and she's not in a horrible situation. But that's something that she needs to clean up and say, cut off. Like, hey, I'm not dealing with this guy. I'm, I want to talk to you. And then you'd be like, all right, cool. We can talk. But yeah, he's like, don't put yourself in a situation where you don't get in trouble because you don't know what this person is capable of for a woman that you're talking to that you're not in a relationship with. Like, this is not your girlfriend. This is not your wife. You're talking to get to know this girl and her ex is popping up left and right. And she hasn't shut that down yet. I do agree with him. Like, let her handle that. You go handle your thing, step away. He's like, you don't have to be gone forever. You can come back around. But definitely don't put yourself in danger trying to fight a man that you're not even in a relationship with the woman. So I'm curious to see how that, I would like to know like a, a comeback on that. But I definitely agree with him on that. Um, don't do that. Like, if that's not comfortable with you, if you're not comfortable with that, you can walk yourself out the relationship. It'd probably be the best case scenario. Now, if you're comfortable with the ex showing up, you're know, like, cool, he can show up all he wants. I, like that's fine like I'm gonna be me I'm gonna take this and you know he talks to me we'll talk about it but other than that like I'm I'm gonna be cool with it but if you're not comfortable with that yeah definitely walk yourself out of that relationship it's not worth not worth the time she need to clean that up before she try to date you and that's how you feel all right moving on to the next video here this is from Taylor Tay Talks Pod and until your ex does this, let's talk about it. I need to know if y'all agree or disagree with this. You cannot get over your ex until one of you starts dating someone new. Let's talk about it. I feel like until one of you starts dating someone new, that door is still metaphorically open. It's like the what if door. It's like, are we writing the part of our story where we go our separate ways and then we reunite and live happily ever after? Or are you about to pop up on social media with the person you told me not to worry about? Okay, well... The, not the person you told me not to worry about. That's that's that implies something other than uh, 
some kind of emotional cheating there at the end of it. But she's saying until one of you guys get into a relationship, you can't, you know, you can't move on from your ex. And I don't agree with her on that. She has to you agree with or disagree. I don't agree with her on that. And the reason why I don't agree with, with Tay on this is because boundaries. You have to set boundaries with your ex. If you're your ex still think what's if you're like no we're not getting back together like we had our, we're going our several ways we didn't work out it is what it is you no know, life happened here's my boundary I refuse to talk to you and if your ex, if you're sitting there worrying about oh well, I could have done this way we, we get back together that's on your ex but that's that's not your responsibility what she's thinking, even and even if that person moves on to somebody else, that door can always still be there. But if your partners, your exes, if you and your ex both have boundaries that we're not getting back together, this is not it. This is we're, we're this is I mean this is it. We're not getting back together. This is the the done deal. Without opening that door, no matter if they're single or not, you're not going to get into that relationship again. It's not. It's not going to happen. It's not gonna happen. Or you do, you start hooking up with this with your ex, and they're like, "Well, I just don't want to get hurt again." Then you're not getting back in a relationship with them again. It's not gonna happen. So, I it doesn't have to be until the person gets in another relationship. No, that doesn't have to be the case at all. It could be as simply as we're not getting back together. They're standing on business, and that's how that's gonna happen. So don't have the person have to get into another relationship because if you just see somebody in another relationship, it doesn't mean they actually healed from the previous relationship. You gotta take time to heal. Take time to figure out about yourself, especially if you've been with somebody for years. Figure out about yourself first. So, I don't agree with her on that. I don't agree with her that you don't get your, the door for your ex is completely closed um, until they get into is still open until they get into a relationship. That's not the case. All right, last video, and then we'll call it a night. Oh, another uh, Tay Talks podcast. Let's see what she has to say here. Don't throw him off his routine. Let's talk about it. Ladies, if you are trying to keep a man that you recently started talking to, do not throw him off of his routine. I will tell you why. Let's talk about it. Recently, I was going on a few dates with this guy. One of our dates, the one night, went really long. We were like hanging out in the car and it was 1030, which doesn't sound like a big deal. But to him, he's used to going to bed at like 830, 9 o'clock because he wakes up at 4 a.m. to work out every morning before work. So towards the end of the date, like I honestly was like, we should get you home. Like I know that you have to get up early. And he was like, no, like I'm enjoying spending time with you. Da da da. Girl, tell me why i get a text the next morning saying i overslept my alarm and missed my workout and immediately i was like even though this man is not blaming me he's associating me with him not being productive i am now seen as a distraction and then two three days later i get the text hey i don't think i'm ready for a relationship and i was like <laughs> no i ladies if you are trying I don't agree with that one. Don't throw him off the routine. He's a grown adult. He's a grown adult. He could have told you, hey, I enjoy spending time with you, but let's wrap it up. I have to go. I had to go to bed. I got to be in the gym tomorrow morning. He's told you uh, overslept, you know. I think one it could be him trying to call small talk. He probably did. Heck, if I did, I'd probably do overslept with the closed face emoji. Like, oh, no. Like, oh, no. My day is ruined. Ah, I got no gym after work. Ah. In a way. Um... <laughs> All I'm saying here, no, nah, don't throw them off a of routine. That could be anybody, though. Anybody can have a routine, then also get the relationship and throw themselves off of it. That doesn't matter here. This is not the case about routines. He's a grown adult. He can tell you, hey, I enjoy time, spending time with you, but I definitely got to get home. You know, can we set up another date next time this week or some later this week? He has the opportunity to do that. That's and she shouldn't blame herself for the fact that he missed the gym. That's not on her. He has his responsibility. He has the opportunity to do that. Routines, because what's going to happen as you slowly get to start dating each other and start talking to each other more and more and more and go on date, you no know, fifty nine, date a hundred, date two hundred. By that point, you guys should be in a relationship. But you guys are going to be merging each other's lives, and your routine will have to change. Yes, you're no longer single, so before you can't move the way you was doing when you were single. 
you have to move away with somebody else in your life and that routine you had will have to change and adjust so your routine's go your routine's going to get thrown off when you start dating somebody especially you're not in a relationship yet you're going to be learning how to date so your routine's going to get thrown off you're making up schedules when you never done before when you're by yourself so that's not her problem in this situation and the whole you know this is not going to work out did he say it's not going to work out because he's throwing her routine off like, if he didn't say that, then you can't assume it's his routine. Or maybe that's the excuse he gave, but you can't hold every man to that. Not every man's going to do that. It's one of those things, if he would, he would kind of thing. If he wanted to spend time with you, he will find a way to make spend time with you. Like this guy was doing, he wanted to spend time with you. And the gym thing, it wasn't that. Guarantee that. He just probably found somebody else or he legit genuinely doesn't want to date and be committed yet. Alright guys, that's it for this episode of Nerdy Dating. If you guys like this episode, please like, please share, please subscribe. I really appreciate y'all. Other than that, see you guys next episode of Nerdy Dating. Oh, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram at Ali Zaka Nerdy Dating. Last but not least, I appreciate y'all and I love y'all. See y'all next episode and keep being awesome. Thank you for watching this episode of Nerdy Dating. I really appreciate it. If there's another episode you want to watch, you can look at it right there. If you want to subscribe to the page and watch more content, it's down here. Also, you have a question about dating, you want to put it in the comment section, go ahead and do it. Or you can send me a dating question to my email of alizakanerdydating at gmail.com. That's alizakanerdydating at gmail.com. And I will answer your question on the next episode of Nerdy Dating. Thank you so much for watching the show. I appreciate you. And keep being awesome.